Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Robert Pickles. I work for Canon, um, so welcome to our UK headquarters here in Reigate. Canon uh, have been involved in Digital Surrey for just less than uh, eight months, I think, so I've been to some but not all of the previous events. Um, we are a fairly passive uh, member of the social media community, um, and yet we're a very, very powerful brand, and uh, that's something I'm trying to change at the moment. Uh, which is why I got involved in Digital Surrey. And of course, when I went along to the first event, I thought, actually, we've got a perfectly good auditorium, which holds about 150 people, and is uh, available. And certainly in the evenings, it's usually empty. So uh, it was a great opportunity to invite you to this side of Surrey, and uh, I I I'd like very much to uh, make you welcome. Uh, clearly, um, there is a, a much more important speaker, though, about to take the stage, and I'd like just to... Uh, to make my last few moments up here to introduce uh, David Froelich. Uh, David works at the Digital World Research Centre at S the University of Surrey. Um, and uh, if any of you have read any of his work, you'll, you'll, know, al you'll know already that it's uh, a fascinating subject that he's working in. And certainly, from our point of view, uh, anything that involves research around photography is, of course, fascinating to us. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to ask uh, David to come up here and uh, give him a warm welcome. So thank you. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> um, I should say I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I have been to quite a few Digital Surrey events and enjoyed them all. I hope I can live up to the standard of the previous speakers. Um, it's also very interesting for me to be at Canon because uh, I spent most of my career at HP, HP Labs in Bristol. Um, so Canon were an arch uh, competitor alongside Kodak and Dell and IBM. Uh, so it's like being in the headquarters of the enemy here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I am an academic now. So uh, the last seven years, or six, six and a half years, I've been at um, the University of Surrey, um, part of Digital World Research Centre, um, and still working on the same things I've always been interested in, which is basically digital media uh, products and experiences. Um, now, I've taken the title of this talk from um, a book which is available to buy, um, if anyone's interested, um, called Snap From Snapshots to Social Media. But when I was preparing this, I realized, actually, the title for this audience should almost be the other way around. Um, I mean, all of our focus in the meetings has been on the very latest social media innovations, um, different kinds of apps connecting people, um, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. In fact, it grew out of a Twitter group, didn't it, I began. Um, and what I want to do in tonight's talk is um, look back, actually, from social media to snapshots and call your attention to the fact that snapshots themselves can be seen as a kind of social media. And I'll kind of try and define that um, in a minute. And the talk really is about uh, learning from the past. So it's looking back, not looking forward so much. Um, although I would like to come right up to date towards the end of the talk and talk about the future of photography and the future of um, kind of social media and social media innovation. So I'll be talking a lot about the innovation process in a way and using photography to, to illustrate that. Um, I should say, quite a few of the DWRC <laughs> people are here. Um, could you stand up if you are here? <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> so, yeah, Christina. <laughs> yeah, Ali, Christina, Jocelyn, Chris, uh, Yanko, and Phil. I hope you're all there. <laughs> um, we're an interdisciplinary group. We're only a small group of about 12. Um, we come from different backgrounds mainly blending design, so uh, product design, interaction design, um, graphic design, brand design, uh, social science, so we have sociologists and anthropologists in the group, um, <coughs> no psychologists at the moment, but I'm about to recruit one, um, and computer science. And all those disciplines, actually computer, computer science and electrical engineering, are um, basically applied to the digital media area and how people in are interacting with um, different types of content. So broadly things like film, music, books, um, theatre, uh, 
and so on, and photographs. This is a quick slide just to, with some names of current projects on, so I haven't got time to go into these, but have a look on the web if you're interested in uh, the other projects we do. Um, again, just for this audience, I'd like to say that um, one reason I really enjoy coming here is that we're quite an unus unusual academic group in that we would like to commercialise some of the best ideas coming out of the group. Um, so we do user-centred innovation in the digital media area. Um, our portfolio is skewed to the left at the moment, but we'd like to begin to connect up some of the projects over time and take some of the best ideas to market in partnership with local companies. Um, so do come talk to us if you have good ideas, want us to join you in your research, um, and we may also contact you about um, exploiting some of our ideas. Um, this approach is relevant for what I'm going to say about the book, because although we use this um, kind of uh, rather haphazard model of four super disciplines involved in innovation, um, usually we use it facing forwards to generate new stuff. So we're usually trying to understand current day practice with user research, um, identify the uses of existing technologies or the potential uses of new technologies, find new business models by which you could sell some of these solutions and design and package technology. Um, about a year, actually about two years ago now, um, some called Risto Sarbas um, approached us about doing a sabbatical for a whole year during 2009. And the book was his sabbatical project, actually. Um, and the idea of it was basically to take a broader look at um, the changing picture, <laughs> uh, if you like, of photography itself. And when I say photography, I don't mean art or commercial photography, I mean domestic photography. Um, so the way in which families and everyday uh, ordinary people use photos in, in their lives to remember the past and to communicate with each other. Um, and it's such a brilliant topic area because it's been going for so long. And actually all of our lives have been touched by the digital revolution in that area. So it's quite an interesting case study for innovation because we're actually living through and have all lived through changes in our own practice, changes in the technology we own, uh, probably not many people using analogue cameras still. Um, but the question is, what are they doing? And where is the industry going? And why is it changing in the way it's changing? And so looking at some of these factors in a bit more general a way, the, in the interaction between people's practices, <coughs> the new technologies coming along, um, the new business models by which companies are forming and growing, and the way in which they're packaged and designed um, was the aim of the book and broadly to look at past, present and future of photography in that kind of holistic way. Um, in the talk, I should say this is, um, this is Risto, uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is his work as well. Um, I can't really do justice to the book itself, but I am going to take a slice of the book focused on the family album. Um, and as I say, especially for this audience, what I'm trying to get to are some lessons for social media innovation that are relevant to us all. Um, but I'm going to talk about snapshots as social media, um, point to three eras of domestic photography that have come out of our analysis, and really the birth and death of the album. And I never thought I would be saying this, but I do think the, the photograph album is dying. Um, and if anyone knows my work, I'm, I'm very interested in paper and augmented paper, partly from my HP days, actually. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, I think people are printing less um, and losing the value of paper. So um, I'd like to tell you about the birth and death of the album. So a snapshot is actually based on a, a very old hunting term, British hunting term, um, referring to shooting from the hip without careful aim. Um, and it's quite a good characterisation of the kind of photos you find in albums, um, because they're often poorly framed, and they look like they've been taken very quickly, and some of them have been taken very quickly. Um, essentially, they're amateur photographs, and they might have this character here. You see uh, you know, the, the guy in the foreground, his head is cut off slightly. But it's a happy picture. He's got his son on his back, 
um, I think it's somewhere in Finland. This is one of Risto's, not, not necessarily Risto's personal photo, but... Um, yeah, so snapshots have been, been with us a long time. Um, in the literature, people have pointed to three values of snapshots in terms of their meaning. Um, they serve to reinforce people's identity, uh, to, to mark them out as members of certain social groups. Uh, here's a father here, um, just by, by virtue of carrying a child, or at least that's how it appears in the, in the image. Um, they, they are documentary evidence of, of things happening, um, so they have a very strong memory function. Uh, they're good memory triggers. Um, and they're used for communication. So those three values are central to the way snapshots are currently thought about and used. Um, now those three, three values actually could really apply to social media in general. In fact, it's quite interesting to think of how you know, some of the artifacts we use, like a tweet or a, uh, a status message, what kind of value that has in, in those terms. Um, but looking at the definition of social media, um, they're really media for social interaction. Um, and this was a list from, from Wikipedia of uh, different kinds of media which are user-generated. So there's kind of a user-generated aspect also tied in with this definition of social media. And in the list, you see photographs or pictures in the list alongside wikis and blogs and other things. Um, so really, I'd like to argue that photographs are an early, an early form of social media themselves, and they're now kind of integrated into newer forms. So if we, if we look back at them, um, how did they come to be, and how have they evolved, and what kind of forces are, are in play uh, in the evolution of photographs? Um, again, in the book, we were looking for kind of a framework to understand all the innovations going on in the area. And we came across this one from Anderson and Tushman, which eventually we used um, in the, in the write-up. Um, I mean, innovation is... I found a nice definition recently from this report by Morgan in 2007. New ideas that work. So they're basically... They're new, they're innovative, but they work in the way that they change practice. So practice might def be defined as... Um, <coughs> The, the everyday uh, behaviour, a kind of everyday behaviour, a routine or behaviour or habit. And so therefore innovation in this kind of area is going to change the way that we all use photographs. Um, and it turns out, well in, in their model they talk about disruptive technologies, either competence enhancing or competence destroying. So something's a sort of piecemeal evolution of an idea or a technology, and then suddenly you get discontinuous um, innovation or invention, which disrupts everything, and their competence destroying, and lead to this era of ferment uh, before things stabilize again, and the technology takes a different path. And if you apply that kind of area to photography, you get these three eras, where in the first era after the invention of the photograph itself, or the photographic uh, method of recording, um, Portraits became the dominant kind of content um, until the, the very first personal camera from Kodak. So uh, the innovation of raw film from George Eastman, who set up Kodak in, 1880, in 1888, or around that time, um, led to a new form of personal photography, which took photography out of a studio setting into people's own homes and families. And that model that we all recognise from our past of uh, you press the button, we do the rest, uh, buying a film in the chemist or, or from wherever and then getting it pro processed when it's full and having the prints sent to you or collecting the prints, that lasted for about 100 years. So that was the Kodak path. And then around about um, 1990, uh, after the invention of CCD... C CCD um, technology capturing light intensity as uh, electrical energy, uh, we have this digital path, which again is a disruptor of the old ways. Um, now broadly, 
what's quite interesting in relation to the values of photography, those three paths appro approximate changes in the balance of the values. So originally, the portrait here are kind of focused on the identity value of images. Um, and that gradually shifted to a focus on memory in the, in the longer period of the Kodak era. And we could describe the current phase of digital photography as referring, as kind of making more salient the communication values of images. Um, and I'll show you a bit more about what I mean in terms of that breakdown now. So most people know who invented the photograph. Um, was it de Geer or was it Talbot? Um, actually, they both... De Geer actually filed the patent for de Geer types in 1839 first, and Talbot, Fox Talbot in the UK, so who's in France, and in the UK, Talbot clocked the fact that there's been something happening in France and quickly uh, published his patent on the color type or Talbot type um, in the same year because he, they'd both been kind of beavering away working on different ways of f fixing images from um, a kind of camera obscura, uh, the protection of an image through a, through a hole. Um, however, not many people know who invented the photograph album or in fact where the album came from at all. Um, there was this big battle of the giants going on, eventually won by uh, Talbot in, in some ways, because his process allowed the printing, his was paper-based, um, the capture of a negative which could then be reproduced in positive form and copied in many, uh, many times. So it was actually a better process, but as you can see here, it was very fuzzy uh, on the right-hand side. So actually Calotype, uh, Daguerreotype won out for about the first ten years <coughs> of, the, of this history. Um, and it was that print-based winner, really, that led to explorations of different kinds of content for images. Um, now, originally, you had to pose or sit for a long time to expose a photograph, actually 10 to 15 minutes, the early daguerreotype. So human subjects weren't very good for that. Uh, so landscapes were very popular in the early days. Um, Frith, Francis Frith set up a whole business capturing uh, English landscapes um, and invented the postcard, again around this time for writing on the back of a print and uh, sending it in the post. Um, but as the technology evolved and as the printing got better, um, so the costs fell and it slotted straight into an existing business of having your portrait painted, which was kind of an aristocratic thing to do. Um, but going to a studio and having your photograph taken cost a lot less and began to fall in price, particularly as you printed the photo uh, very small. So there was a, a standardisation of the size of photographs at around two and a half inches by four. And I've, I'll show it here. Um, this is my business card with the two and a half by four board around it. So it's slightly bigger than a business card. Sometimes these were themselves mounted on a card back, backing, so they'd be slightly bigger than that. But people used to uh, have their portrait developed onto these prints, and they would give them out. So they, they a practice of using photo-based business cards, with no writing, just your photo, um, and swapping them, developed um, as a kind of Carter mania, it was described of, as in the literature. At this, at this scale, and, um, in addition to personal photographs, photographs of famous people were also taken and sold. So you could buy photos of Abraham Lincoln, uh, Napoleon, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, uh, Lily Langtry, and so on. Um, and with the swapping of all these cars, um, actually the one final innovation brought the cost down even further, and that was a camera from Dis Derry in 1854, actually. Um, which led to um, very low-cost production of multiple exposures on the same sheet of paper. Um, and I think uh, Risto did a calculation that you could get 12 uh, cartes de visite for about $2, whereas it would cost you about $2 um, for one 
before this innovation um, in the equivalent of modern money. I'm not quite sure how, how did the uh, calculation. Um, but it was a radical drop in cost, and it led to a huge amount of um, portrait photography in studios and the swapping of cars. And at some point along the way, some bright spark in a, uh, in a photographic processing company had the idea of uh, giving people albums to put them in. Um, I had thought album came from the word albumen, which is uh, part of the process for producing uh, high quality um, prints, but it turns out al albus is a Latin derivative for white, so it means white. And actually there was a practice from the 1600s of capturing people's autographs, which absolutely connects with this, because what these albums became used for was collecting, first of all, members of the family. So they became visual family, uh, uh, family trees, um, but also visitors and calling cards of visitors to the family. Uh, and also famous people like Abraham Lincoln that you might have collected. So they were the prototypical Facebook. They are a visual representation of your social network. Um, and they were popular for uh, 28 years. And I was just talking to <laughs> various people before we came in about whether Facebook would be still here. Facebook's been around for about seven years. <laughs> And it's quite interesting to think whether Facebook will be around for the next uh, 21 years or whatever to match these cart to visit albums. But basically, the family album, uh, as such, was a social network record. Um, and you can see in the, in the rhyme here, it's encouraging you to collect more. So not only was this in, you know, kind of in place, this accessory business encouraged further printing and further... Uh, collection in order to kind of fill up the album. And it was based on family Bibles and prayer books <coughs> in, in which people already wrote um, their family trees. And go, it, as I say, it goes back to the autograph idea as well, that each of these pages is the identity of someone in your social network. It's the profile picture, in other words. All that changed in the Kodak era um, <coughs> in a rather interesting way so although there was a technical innovation by Eastman for the roll film, shown here on the right, um, which led to these personalized uh, or personal cameras that people could now afford to own and could manage using, because photography was complex before, before that, um, they were marketed to women. So Kodak had a concerted marketing campaign around the launch of their products. Um, promoting the albums, as, uh, as you've just seen, to women as uh, kind of uh, curators of family memory. Um, and they were sold as ways of capturing your family life. And it worked. So we gradually saw the dropping away of um, people who weren't in your family from the family album, a more, a more, con more of a concentration on the family itself and family life and the kind of images that we recognize from probably our own albums or certainly our parents' albums of high days and holidays, um, achievements, celebrations, vacations. Now that now you can get out of the studio into the real world. Um, and this practice, so this kind of album lasted for a hundred years. <laughs> How cool is that? It's actually a very stable technology and business model. Um, there were various threats to it, such as uh, Polaroid is a very interesting threat to the way the, the Kodak model worked with the processing lab and so on, um, just developing there, there and then on the camera. Um, but that never quite overtook or changed the actual dominant Kodak path. And I guess towards the end of this era, we had... Um, an increase in the number of prints, because people became more affluent, people were able to buy multiple cameras in the family. Um, and when I, in some of my work, interview families about their photographic practice, um, people are always guilty about albums. Um, actually, mothers in particular are very guilty, um, because they feel it's their job somehow, from a Kodak, I don't know where it comes from, but uh, <laughs> uh, to archive the family history in the right way. And there's kind of a moral order about 
photographs and how you're supposed to look in a photograph. Uh, in fact, uh, Liron Kroll uh, gave us a talk this week, um, just finishing some work at the RCA on um, the nature of the album, the, the kind of um, vernacular and the statements made in albums, the quite stylistic uh, statements. But um, typically you'd find these piles of loose photographs in cupboards um, and people never quite keeping up with their albums. Um, so in some ways, the system was partly breaking down at the end of this era anyway. So in terms of what's been happening since 1990, the answer is a very lot. Um, <laughs> and in fact, it was nearly killing us in the book to, to summarize it all, because um, the pace of change has been so fast, um, and the innovations so many, that what, what has really happened, we realized that, you know, in kind of working through all this, is that the infrastructure for photography has moved from a very self-contained, um, simple infrastructure of a camera, a roll of film, and some prints. Maybe an album to put them in, or some frames. And that was the infrastructure. Um, of course, there was the developing service um, behind that, but that was behind the scenes from the consumer's point of view. So the consumer's infrastructure was fairly simple. And what has really happened is that with the capture of images on digital devices, the infrastructure for digital photography is now the ICT infrastructure. It is the computer, uh, the printer, the camera, the mobile device, the laptop, the tablet, the photo display, and so on. Um, so that at once expands the range of, th range of things people can do with photographs, but it also leads to an enormous complexity that wasn't there before. And in a way, we've all had to come to terms with that complexity in terms of how we, how we cope with it, which aspect of it we choose to go for ourselves. And at the, at the early days, and I was in at the beginning of this, so I, I worked for HP Labs. Um, I was assigned to the camera and imaging division, and HP launched um, a photo scanner, a photo printer, and a, a digital camera in 1995 uh, under the PhotoSmart brand, part of which still exists. Um, and HP's view was that what would happen was, was something they called the, the home photo lab. And that was composed of PC, photo printer, um, and digital camera. And the main benefit of digital, digital photography in the industry at that time was considered to be processing photos at home. So making the prints at home. So this was bad news for Kodak because people didn't need to go to the photo processing uh, service anymore. They could just do it in their own home. Um, and it was good news for people like Canon and HP, who made money out of printers and ink and paper. Um, but of course, it never happened. So I carried out uh, the first published study of digital camera use in the world in 19, uh, 1999, um, published in 2002. And we were looking at uh, this home photo lab idea, and there's a big debate in HP about photo-quality prints. In fact, the, the whole focus was on photo-quality prints. Could you ever get a digital camera good enough to print out a photograph where you do this Turing test, and you'll never, you couldn't get, guess the dis difference between a, a real photograph and a digital photo. Um, but it turned out to be much less relevant to people than, uh, than these companies thought, um, because people stopped printing so many images and were more selective about their prints. Um, and as you, as you think about the history, the history can be described in terms of the addition to elements in that map. So it did start roughly around the PC, as a cluster around the PC. One of the things HP did, and probably Canon as well, is take the PC out of the loop so you could just use a camera with the printer itself. So the, printer would dock to, uh, the camera would dock to the printer, um, or you take the card out and push it into the printer and so on. But really, uh, the camera phone and then the internet changed all that. And just to race through this, um, the camera phone was probably the biggest change. Um, in that, it was already an audio uh, and a communication-centric device. So it was a phone, after all, with a camera facility on it. 
And so phones are used for communication. Uh, cameras were really used for memory, remember, in terms of the, the values. Um, and you began to see a new kind of content. So the first uh, study of camera phones was done in um, Helsinki in 2000, sorry, in 1999 also, or 2000, published in 2002 here by Ilpo Koskinen and colleagues. Um, and this is one of the first camera phone images recorded um, in, a, in a published study, let's say. And you can see it's actually an MMS message. Um, so it's not me. <laughs> um, it's uh, somebody in Italy on their holidays just sending a quick message back, photo and text, to their friends saying, look where I am on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, I'm sitting in below a mountain in Italy uh, having beer and grappa and pizza, and it's really hot, <laughs> and I'm not working. Um, and that kind of image is not the kind of image you might necessarily put in an album. So, for example, if I got that image from my friend, I wouldn't put it in my album, because <laughs> it's not my image. <laughs> so, again, the circulation of image, images uh, increased with camera phones, not necessarily through MMS, as it turned out. So MMS wasn't used so much as expected by companies like Nokia. Um, people tended to share images on the phone itself. Um, or upload them onto the web, and that's kind of the next part of the story. Um, because the other thing that started to happen was online sharing. Um, I mean, this is my Facebook page. <coughs> it's full of images. Even just at that, at that distance, you can see the profile pictures, but you can also see the photo album. So actually, photographs are kind of part and parcel of the Facebook experience already now. And they've led away from a kind of domestic circulation of photos to a semi-public sharing of photos. Flickr is an even more extreme case where now you're sharing not necessarily with friends that you know, you're sharing outside with, with people that you don't know. Um, and that's a significant change from current practice of the family album sharing within the, the extended family and to friends. Um, the other huge change is um, photographs suddenly become <coughs> part of the same media, or the, they can be become part of the same media space occupied by video and music and audio and other kinds of media. So it becomes very easy to combine uh, media. And again, I remember in HP there was a big debate about uh, the convergence of camcorders and cameras. Was there in the future just going to be one device that does everything? Um, it's interesting, we still have the two forms, but both devices do both, don't they? You can usually take stills on a camcorder and video on a camera. Um, I worked for a long time on a middle ground, which I refer to as audio photos. Um, so this is a kind of a complex, multi-layered audio photo between photos and video, and it just shows you the richness of the space. So it becomes possible to be creative and to be innovative yourselves as a consumer, combining different kinds of sound and image. So this is Betty's Tea Rooms in York. Um, you might have different types of sounds on different edges of the frame of the photo. This is uh, ambient sound taken at the time. Just kind of puts you in the mood to appreciate this photograph, the chink of crockery, um, conversation going on. You could add music if you want. This is kind of a 1920s jazzy thing that goes very well with Betty's Tea Rooms. Um, <laughs> And voiceover, of course, storytelling. Um, this, this is one of the highlights of the day, really. Um, Mid-afternoon, uh, we went to uh, Betty's Tea Rooms. It's a really famous uh, place. So the bottom edge uh, could be conversation. So every time you get this out, to to you could store the conversation around it. And so you can also have the video clip if you want. Wait, so this becomes a bit like a Harry Potter album with sound. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there's great potential for what's now called digital storytelling. Uh, so I think you heard from Jocelyn in the previous Digital Surrey, the Petra Kucha thing, uh, thinking about digital storytelling as an evolution of photography into this multimedia area, so people could have multimedia albums in the future, um, or ways of telling stories which are augmented in real time. Um, the other big trend, as I've mentioned, is paper-to-screen based sharing. This is work by uh, Abby Durant, uh, a PhD student of mine. Um, now at Nottingham University, who was looking at photo displays in the home. Uh, this was with Microsoft, actually, so it's a Microsoft-funded PhD. And 
the vision she started to develop there, or we started to develop with Microsoft, was of a central archive which has multiple windows on it. So you could imagine um, multiple photo displays in the home, one of which she called Photo Mesh would be a, a central collage and a, and a way of viewing the whole collection. And then you'd have other uh, photo frames elsewhere in the house. This is a more personalised one. You might have in a, in a bedroom. You have to do some maintenance to this. This is a solar-powered uh, <coughs> photo frame. And the, the photo fades if you don't kind of keep it um, up to date and keep it in, in line with the sun. Um, and then the, then the photo would change. So the dynamic behaviour of photo frames is, is very interesting, isn't it, in relation to static frames that we're used to with printed photos. And they lend themselves to a, a, a large number of new behaviours, such as the proactive photo display, which I'll mention in a moment. The one on the right there is called photo switch, um, and that's a two-sided display with a sliding door, um, and was done for her research looking at mothers and daughters and the kind of photos they would like on display and would agree or disagree about. Um, because it, what's also happened is a kind of democratisation of technology in the family um, so that more people now have cameras in the family, including kids. Um, so it's not just the father or the mother, the parent, um, acting as the family photographer anymore. It's everybody taking photos on cameras and camera phones and they all feel some kind of ownership of those photos. So simply putting them all on display as the family ar archive doesn't work, actually, Abby found in the PhD. There is conflict. It needs to be negotiated. You need some kind of markup of display, display rules, actually. So we, that was one of the technical ideas that, um, in terms of knowing what can be displayed in which room of the house, um, photos in some ways need to be tagged for that. Um, and this is a final slide just on some of the developments um, in research labs and our own labs, actually, our, our own uh, university. So because we've lost the tangibility of printed photos, or we are losing it, um, there are lots of attempts being made, again, across the industry to bring back that tangibility somehow through situated screen-based displays. Um, or screen-based displays interacting with paper. So, in fact, the, the one on the far top left there is a Microsoft um, Cambridge, Microsoft Research Cambridge prototype of the home, home archive, which has a tabletop display on the top, but it also has an overhead camera for scanning, so you can actually scan objects into it. So, precious things like uh, ornaments you could scan into your archive, uh, not photo collection, archive. Um, <laughs> It has a printer on the second level, so you can start printing things. You can continue to print, so you can kind of print and recycle things. Um, and it can push photos to other displays in the house. In, a, in effect, it's a, it's a development of Abby's original picture on the previous slide. Um, they've also built the shoebox there, which is a tangible way of browsing a photo collection displayed on the front edge of the box. So you might have a shoebox for a certain year, for example, or a certain person. Um, and it's, you can actually control the display by rifling through like a virtual stack of cards in the box. Um, Diamond Spin is top right there, that's Mitsubishi. Lots of work on tabletop displays in general, but um, they were one of the first to apply it to photo sharing. And lots of new visualisation of, of photos and big trees and uh, shrinking and growing collages um, to manage all these multiple images <laughs> that no one knows what to do with. Um, and three on the bottom are from our, our group. Connie Goldstein, um, not here tonight, but she did a MSC project at Eindhoven before joining us on interacting photo cubes. So cubic displays for each member of the family where you can pour material between the displays. So um, with tangible UI now, you can um, instrument these objects with tilt sensors and so on, um, and set up computational rules for the transfer of materials across uh, the devices. Um, Sam Zagan from our group uh, did the middle one, thinking about streaming photos to, from uh, multiple people to the same display as a kind of social presence collage. And the one on the left is a Kodak 
piece of work with Kodak, a proactive display which reminds you of forgotten images. Um, so imagine an advert for a photo. Um, one, one idea which started that project actually was that each photo could have a birthday. Um, and on its birthday, it sends you an email saying, hey, remember three years ago you were doing this with these people? Maybe it puts you in touch with those people. Um, so in the future, you're going to have material which does things to you as well as you doing things to it. Um, so what does all this mean for design of social media? Um, I mean, at, at the top level, a lot of that stuff is still relevant to, to the use of photographs in social media anyway. Uh, remember the, the photos on the Facebook page. So um, I think we are going to see a lot more tangible UIs and displays and interacting displays for social media content, um, both in the home and outside the home and in public spaces as well. So you're already seeing large public displays in big city centres. Um, we're going to see a lot more of those and we're going to be able to interact with those with our mobiles. Um, so imagine more, more events, more co-located things being interleaved with uh, message-based experiences with social media. Um, I think I've shown in some of those examples that often the inno innovation results from the interplay of these factors. It's not necessarily a, uh, a lone inventor that comes up with the photo album. It's a kind of a, con a convolution <laughs> of changes in the way people are using the content. Um, the cost of the content was, is critical, actually. So the business model makes a massive difference to the, the pervasiveness, if you like, of any new behavior. Um, and the design and the packaging of the technology makes a huge difference. So if it's too complicated, which it can be in this new space, it can be too complicated. There are, there are ideas that you will have now in your heads that are just too complicated to work. Um, I have them all the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, design is really, really important to bringing simplicity and beauty uh, and, and art to these uh, areas, these technologi technological areas. Um, so that business positioning and social shaping are as important as uh, technology and design. And these social media evolve over long periods of time, so we need to kind of reset, reset our mindset. Don't give up on an idea, actually, if, if it hasn't particularly taken off in the first few months. I know that, is, that has to be, in a way, the mindset of an entrepreneur, because you can't stay in business unless you kind of generate enough money to keep going. But um, some of these things have their time. So remember the Carte de Visite album, the prototypical Facebook. It took about 100 years for it to come back. Um, so it kind of went away and came back again in a different, in a different form. And that's, that's true in lots of areas. I was thinking of the, the stereograph. was a late 1800s, 1800s invention for viewing stereoscopic um, photographs, which was popular for a time, but has disappeared from most of our eyes. And now it's coming back in 3D cinema. So all these things kind of don't go away in some ways. They're, they're, they're still part of the fabric of um, knowledge and uh, ideas. And sometimes an idea needs, needs its time to, to breathe. Um, and I've also shown that features change a lot faster than practices and values. So those three values of, of photographs are still present today, actually. And in fact, I'd argue that although I badged the digital era is communication-based. There's a partial return to identity with all this social networking stuff. There's a beginning of a return or a, or a combination, if you like, of images for identity. So um, we have more opportunities now than ever to shape and craft both our own memory, but also our own identity and the way we portray people to, to others. Uh, sorry, portray ourselves to others. Um, and you'll also notice that this issue of infrastructure, uh, which we speak about in much more length in the book, actually, um, it's one of Risto's um, key areas, is also key to success. So you can't really design anything now, a days, without paying attention to this infrastructure and to the standards. So just like we needed JPEG for images, we also needed the two and a half 
inch by four inch standard for carte de visite. In a way, that standard was the thing that unlocked the behavior. So the standards and the infrastructure are absolutely key to new practices taking off and being successful. I've no idea how that does relate to your, <laughs> to your businesses, but um, I hope it's enough to have been entertaining and somewhat useful. So I'll stop there. Does anyone have any questions for David? Andy? So that was absolutely fantastic. fascinating, David. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, but I'll ask you one. Yes, I will ask you one. Um, you, you touched on it towards the end, uh, just where you were mentioning through your points about identity. And one of the, the interesting thoughts I've, I've been having is around how the ability to identify ourselves in a photo, tag ourselves in an image. Mm. Um, previously, our photo albums have been you know, private, kept to ourselves. Now they're public, and then we choose to tag ourselves in them and build up that presence online. I mean, have you got any thoughts around how that ability to mark identity or have others mark you as be being in an image is, is affecting, is yeah, affecting that's it? A, that's a great question. I should have pointed to that as one of this turn back to identity again, because I think it absolutely reinforces that point. Um, no, I mean, I think it goes another level beyond people just sending you their own photos, doesn't it? Because now there's not only your personal archive or family archive, there's, there's the internet archive of all the pictures of you um, taken by whoever took them. I think it raises a lot of difficult issues for control and privacy. Um, so the ability, for example, to untag yourself or just have a photo removed that you don't like is really difficult today. Um, especially if somebody else took it. So if you took it, it's probably controllable, but if somebody else took it, it's not. Um, also, what they say about you, what, what material is around that, the context, and so on, is very difficult. Um, we've just done, well, I've just finished writing up another piece of work which throws another complexity on this story of tagging. Um, it is the same piece of work as the Kodak, the Kodak display I showed you. So it was a project called Forgotten Images, and we interviewed people about um, what takes people back to old photographs. Um, <coughs> and one of the discoveries we made was that when people look again at an old photograph, they see it with the benefit of the experience between the photo was taken, between the time the photo was taken and the time that they're looking at it now, and that will can sometimes radically change their interpretation of the image. Um, and this has implications for tagging behaviour, because not necessarily for tagging identity, but for tagging meaning and um, labels of what it means to you. So, for example, we had a uh, picture of a young boy in one family taking out the rubbish, <coughs> happy, smiling face. And when the parents looked at it again, they remembered him getting sick. So he had, he had a life-threatening illness shortly after the photo was taken. Um, so that's what it reminded them of. So, so memory works in a very strange way. <laughs> and it's not always um, the memory of the time the photo was taken. Um, so again, usually tagging is thought, thought to be something that's done around the time the photo was taken. Um, but actually tags need to evolve over time. Um, and people need control over, them, over those over time as well. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, but, uh, I was going to ask about the privacy element. So it was coming around to more fish communicating. I was horrified the other day. Somebody had put on Facebook a picture of me from 12 years ago at Glastonbury. Very close because the water was in my hand. <laughs> But um, <laughs> I didn't, you know, it's all the sort of stuff sort of, I've got absolutely no control over. Now I'm not a private person, I'm a blog, I'm a blog, I'm a blog but there, there's still a line, I think everybody has a line to make the page. I just wonder what your, your views were on, on, on digital photography and social media and where these things come together and the way that society reacts to them. Uh, so I think it's a big issue to answer in a single I'm sorry. question. <laughs> um, it's probably a lot of talking. 
I mean, I, I absolutely agree it's, it is an issue. Uh, so I think um, there needs to be discussion of where the new boundaries are. I do think, though, that people's... Uh, the acceptability of sharing information changes from age to age. So, um, uh, and it even goes down to things like use of the mobile phone. If you remember in the early days of the mobile phone, talking on the phone in a public place was kind of embarrassing. Uh, so, to being heard, being overheard, having a conversation listened into. Whereas now you can sit on a train <laughs> and quite happily listen to many interesting or not so interesting conversations. Um, so I think you know, these practices change over long periods <coughs> of time, like we saw. And we may find people getting more used to having that happen to them. Um, but that's not to say that we don't need legislation um, and technology to help control where we are now. Um, but I think our attitude yeah, to, to information sharing will, will change as well. Um, I mean, I use the term now to refer to the collection because you can no longer kind of just talk about photographs because of the convergence with other media. Um, the, the home media collection, in some ways, is replacing the photograph album. I guess that's what I'm proposing. I might be wrong, actually. I might, uh, and I've, in some ways, I quite like to be wrong because I've, I've done other work and we are involved in other work um, on augmented paper where you could use the a beautiful physical photo book, for example, as your remote control to a screen-based uh, archive. So you could, as you turn a page, you could have video clips coming up, or if you point to areas on the page, and so on. But yeah, the archive is absolutely central to the future of this area, because it will be multimedia. It will be multivocal, multi-person, so it will be from... Uh, different members of the family or different members of a community, uh, like a friendship group. Um, so I think technology to navigate the archive, to uh, mark up and organize the archive is very important. And in the absence of organization, the many thousands of images and video clips and media elements that people record will be lost. Um, whether people will care, <laughs> It's kind of another question, but um, at the moment, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a field day for the technologists because um, they know there's a kind of a computational problem here to be solved, and no one's really solved it. So people like Yanko Kalich in the audience there works in the Centre for Vision, Speech and Signal Processing at Surrey. And uh, yeah, that's a huge field, um, trying to work out ways of handling archives. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.